Welcome back to Tabletop Assault. I'm Ross, and today I'm going to continue my segments on analysing the Necron Codex. Today we're going to look at Vargard Oberon, uh, sort of the secondary unit to Nemesaur Zandrik. You often see them played together because to get the most out of them for some sneaky tricks, you will, you will find that they work best used together. Really for kind of like one ability, but I'll go into that. In this, uh, in this segment. So how these usually work, if I'm covering a special character I will do a sort of lore section of them just to speak a wee bit about the character and a wee bit of information on them, won't be too long. Then I'll have a look at the stats of the character himself, special abilities that they can use and war gear. We then look at any sort of warlord traits that they can use, uh, stratagems and if applicable uh, legion traits or in this case dynasty codes, uh, relics which may be applicable as well. So with that, let's have a look at some lore for Vargard Oberon. And so we come to Protector and Shadow of Nemesar Zandrik. Probably his most loyal of his, of his retinue, and you know a large reason why he hasn't been taken out by opponents already. Uh, that's both on the battlefield and his own political court. Oberon knows that the universe has changed since the Great Sleep. His mind not, uh, has not been damaged unlike his master. And he has since, you know, given up, you know, he's spent quite a bit of time giving up trying to persuade Zandrik to sort of realise what reality truly is. Uh, in a previous one we talked about Zandrik, uh, he doesn't see reality well. Despite this, he remains ever loyal to Zandrik, even uh, in his compromised state, which leads to a lot, and this is probably sort of my favourite, you know, you know, my favourite quote in the Codex, uh, so like any dedicated servant, Oberon attends to all loose ends created by Zandrik's eccentricities. And oh boy, can I imagine the sort of fun they get up to. There must be a fair few crazy moments. So, from taking opponents captive, because you know Zandrik still believes in sort of the honour of combat, and he still believes he's fighting his kingsmen from a millennia ago, Taking these opponents onto, you know, the Necron fleet with them, so sort of, to try and parley with them, must be just mental. You know, other, you know, Necron lords and Oberon looking on as they are told to try and treat with, you know, an orc warlord, you know, that is raging against their captors, elder farseers that are using psychic abilities to try and escape, or just an Astrium Militarum commander wondering what the hell is going on. Uh, these are situations that Oberon needs to resolve and probably happy to do so. His uh, duties however do not end there. The other threats of course are a lot more personal and these are ones of you know others scheming to usurp Zandrek and he's a bit more vulnerable state but almost nothing escapes the eyes and ears or whatever Necrons have for eyes and ears I suppose uh, of Oberon and keeping his master safe uh, with political intrigue is incredibly important. Those, uh, those who think that they can, you know, usurp Zandrek, you know, in his more vulnerable moments, need to be very, very careful of Oberon. Finally, we have Oberon charge of protecting Zandrek on the battlefields, and he does a very effective job of doing this. Uh, he's an effective fighter, and he also has the ghost mantle, uh, the ghost walk mantle, which allows him to relocate along with uh, unit, you know forces around him to aid Zandrik almost inst instantaneously where he is. And this is an interesting you know, combination, this ability to relocate uh, to his master's side can really help your forces in the actual tabletop game itself. So yeah, that's a wee bit about Vargard Oberon, very much protector of Nemesis Zandrik and deals with a lot of the crap that Nemesis Zandrik has to, you know, sort of does in his own, uh, you know, in his own vulnerabilities. So let's have a look at Vargard Oberon in terms of stats uh, and abilities on the tabletop. So Vargard Oberon is movement 5, which okay, slow, but that's what you expect from just about all Necron Lords. Weapon skill 2 plus, excellent because you want him to hit reliably in combat. Bliss skill 3 plus, no problem, not getting any ranged abilities. Strength 5, toughest 5 which is kind of standard what you'd expect, you know. Wound 6, um, 
I think it's a little bit higher than an average chaos, uh, chaos uh, of a overlord, yep. So a bit more wounds. Four attacks, so more attacks. Leadership 10, yep. And a 2 plus save. So all that, pretty excellent. Uh, good stats, higher wounds, higher attacks. Makes him a bit more reliable in combat. In terms of weaponry, he has a war scythe, which adds plus 2 to strength. Bring him to strength 7, which is not bad. Would be nicer to be at uh, 8, but can always get one. Minus 4 AP, so if you've got armor, he's near enough shredding right through it. Uh, so even a 2 plus save is going to go down to a 6 up save, so armor just gets destroyed. And 2 damage, which is not bad, but not great. I would have preferred it to be 3 damage, and then he would have been an absolute monster. So not bad. Living Metal, which uh, just about I think every Necron character has, which will give him a wound back uh, at the start of their turn, so that's fine. Cleaving Counter Blow. If Argard Oberon is slain during the fight phase, do not remove his model until the end of the phase. He can still fight in this phase if he has not already done so. So, very easy to forget about this ability to go, ah, he's slain, ah, he's dead, take him off. Handed to have and could be good, but you have to, you know, die for it to work, which is not good. You know, you don't want to die and, and sort of have that work. Interesting, you can pull this off and then possibly re resurrect him to troll your opponent further. Uh, I can see this leading to some fun, you know, combinations. Now, I would have preferred this more of a case of that if Fargar Oberon made a successful save, he can maybe take uh, an additional attack after uh, attacks have been resolved to him. That can lead to a stupid amount of attacks if given a 2-up save. So maybe after a successful save, uh, on a roll of 6, he can make a successful attack. But that might be just a little bit too many dice roll there as well. I just feel that if you have to die to make an ability work, it's not the best, unless it's an explosion and does mortal wounds, but even then I'm not a big fan of that. Essentially dying to get your attacks back if you have not attacked is not ideal in my eyes. But it's nice to have, just don't want you to die. The Lord's Will, uh, reroll wound rolls of one for friendly Sutic infantry that are within six inches of Vargrad Oberon. I believe that is just the same as any sort of normal Lord's ability, uh, which I didn't realise Lords allow reroll ones to wound with uh, just a regular Lord. So that's really good, very handy to have, useful to have when accompanied with Nemesor Zandrek. We also have Vargard's Duty, roll a d6 each time Nemesor Zandrek loses a wound whilst within three inches of Vargard Oberon. On a 2+, plus, Oberon can incept that hit. Zandrek does not lose a wound, but Oberon suffers a mortal wound. So tricky, it's not as good as I think when it comes to, say, uh, you know, you've got the Tau's, uh, you know, their shield drones. Shield drones essentially can take a last cannon and on, uh, on when they take it, they just essentially die, but it's only a mortal wound. Vargar Oberon is basically the wound that is suffered, he takes it instead. Now, does that stop the D6 damage coming through from a last cannon? So, you know, he does not lose a wound. You know, he can incept that hit, it does not lose a wound. Mm. When it comes to actually losing, I think it's when you lose the wound, so it's the damage inflicted. So you still suffer, say a last cannon does five damage, the wounds start ticking off. You roll to share them between the two. Let me know if I'm right in that interpretation. But it does mean you can spread the wounds out between them quite effectively and use living metal to pick them away at them. It would be nice if you had that sort of shield drone trick where you go, right, cool, you go for Nemesis Andric. And you do six damage, cool, I'll just put it as a mortal wound onto Vargard Oberon. That would have been a little bit too much if you'd ask me, but it would have been nice. And the final one is the main reason why you probably want to take one, if not both these characters, uh, because this gives you quite a bit of mobility. Ghost Walk Mantle. At the end of your own, uh, at the end of, at the end of any of your movement phases, you can remove Vargard Oberon and a friendly Sutek infantry within six inches of Vargard Oberon, other than Nemes or Zandrik, from the battlefield and set them up so that all models are within six inches, six inches of Nemes or Zandrik, and more than one inch from an enemy model. So this offers quite a lot of mobility to be able to relocate to Nemesis Andrick if needed. And there's a lot of fun tricks you can do with that. <clears throat> so this is why you want both of them together, as it adds a lot of mobility to your force. Essentially you want to use Zandrick almost as a scout force to get into position and then 
bring Oberon in a unit with him, possibly Lich card, uh, into a threatening position. Being able to deploy an inch away from your opponent, but must be in range of Zandrik is interesting as well. So you basically have to be within six inches, six inches of Zandrik, but an inch away from your opponent. Now, my favourite would be this. Take the Deceiver, take him and, I, and you get to move the Deceiver and D3 units, one of which must be Zandrik, and move them across the field. So if you roll low, it's going to be Deceiver and Zandrik move across the field. You know, they have to be, I think, more than uh, nine inches away from your opponent uh, when they do so, but they can actually move afterwards. They simply just can't charge. Uh, or if you're lucky, you might end up with lots of units. You might end up with D, you know, three, in which case you can move the Deceiver, Zandrik, and I don't know, uh, two units of Necron Warriors, maybe Immortals, whatever. Move them along with it and they redeploy and do some fun. Uh, after this, you then have relocated Zandrek. You know, you then choose to relocate Oberon to be within Zandrek's range. So you then go, right, cool. Oberon's then going to relocate, and he can relocate within six inches of Nemesis or Zandrek, and also uh, with it, without an inch of your opponent. So essentially, you know, you move into ahead of Nemesis or Zandrek. You then deploy Oberon and another unit, so say it's Lich Guard, <coughs> which work ahead of Zandrek, so he was say 9 inches away from opponent. You then put uh, these units 6 inches in front of uh, Nemesis Zandrek. You're looking at like a 3 to 4 inch charge, uh, which these units can charge when they do activate this ability. Uh, this happens at the end of your movement phase while the Deceiver was at the, I think, the, before the first battle round. Crazy. You can then add on, say, if you want some survivability, a cryptic with the with the veil of darkness, which can relocate at the end of the turn. They can deploy away as well, adding in a buff of you know for your reanimations and your and your uh, potential five up pinball. They take unit with them as well, so that could be you know another lich guard unit if you want. It can be something else. They have to be nine inches away from your opponent when they do use the, the Veil of Darkness. But assuming you got all the rolls off, that would be the Deceiver, Oberon, uh, Vargard, uh, a, 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 an HQ carrying a, a Nightmare, uh, the Nightmare Shroud. Is that the right one? Or, yep. I'll just give you a second to give you, a, yeah, the Veil of Darkness, sorry. Veil of Darkness. So you've got. Uh, the Knight the Deceiver, Nemesis Andric, Barguard, the Caddy for the Veil of Darkness, so that's four, uh, four big hero units in there, and then a potentially Oberon brings a unit, the Veil of Darkness brings a unit, and potentially the Catan brings them, so that's eight potential units across the field, uh, of which some of them can't charge, but they certainly can't shoot, many of them can charge, and potentially within a three or four inch charge range, and just general craziness, and this works against a lot of your, uh, a lot of uh, Necron's weakness when it comes to mobility. Mass relocation, I've done it once with simply just the Deceiver and it is devastating, but the more units you bring, the funnier it is. Whether it's going to be competitive or not, I don't know, it really depends on your opponent, but certainly being able to relocate up to eight units, you know, if you get first turn by the end of your first movement phase, can be devastating and none of them count as reinforcements because they all technically started on the field at the first battle round so they're not reinforcements you can happily bring and relocate them all in the first turn let me know if i'm wrong in that interpretation and i might mention that one or two times maybe when i'm speaking about characters and certainly when i'm talking about zebra but that can be a real fun combination for such a mass one have you done a mass movement force like that before let me know, let me know, because it sounds like a lot of fun, and I'll certainly give it a try in one of the games in the future. For our Dynastic Codes, uh, Sutek, Relentless Advance, nope, this will add absolutely zero to uh, to Oberon. Um, he's got no ranged abilities, all about co combat, so no, no help. Warlord Trait. Now, for this one, when it comes to the Warlord traits, this one might be not bad to make him the Warlord. <clears throat> it's going to be Hyperlogical Strategist, which seems a bit weird on him. Once per battle, you can reroll a single hit, wounds roll, or damage roll made for your Warlord, which Oberon will probably take full advantage of. 
In addition, if your army's Battleforged and your Warlords on the battlefield, roll a d6 each time you spend a command point to use Stratagem on a 5 plus, that command point is immediately refunded. So yeah, not bad. Certainly before Tactical Restraint, this would be amazing because you could uh, get more command points potentially. However, uh, I'm less pleased with it. I don't play many forces where you can command point farm. I believe Necrons is the main one I play you can. It's just a bit more difficult because I play certainly Necrons where I only have about four command points to play back. Five plus to gain command points back means I should only recover one, maybe two, which is a little, little bit tricky. Uh, I just believe there's other Warlord traits that certainly to my playstyle work a little bit better. However, this is his preset one. Uh, the personal reroll is going to be good for Vargard. He's going to use it probably a lot more than Nemes or Zandrek's going to use it. He's good in combat, so it's nice. Uh, I just feel when it comes to a combat monster like Vargard Oberon, I would prefer more of a combat orientated Warlord trait, which there is a plethora out there. He may be Sutek, but he's not a hyperlogical strategist. So I just feel on that side, it's a little bit lazy on the rule side. He is not a hyperlogical strategist. Nemes or Zandrek is. Emotech is. Vargard, if he's a warlord, should be more of a combat orientated one. So, yep, yeah, it's nice, but it's not the one I'd personally like, both in lore and in usage. When it comes to stratagems, stratagems are a tricky one for Necrons. They are widely spread out between they can work for Catans, work for, uh, you know, various units within them, and there's a few that do focus on the HQs. The main one being Resurrection Protocol. One command point, use this stratagem when a Necron character from your army, excluding Transient Infinite and Catan Shards, are slain. At the end of that phase, roll a d6. On a 4+, plus, that character is set up again as close as possible to his previous position, and more than one inch away from any models, with one wound remaining. This stratagem cannot be used to resurrect the same model more than once per battle. Funny stratagem with Oberon, uh, you know, strike him down before he attacks and he still attacks. Red is a wreck, strike him down again before he attacks and he gets to strike again as well. Overall, one command point, always going to be useful on a character if they go down and you really want to keep them going. Uh, you know, I just wish it was maybe a bit more reliable, you know, they come back at a 3 plus so it's 66% rather than a 4 plus where it's 50-50%. It's done me good sometimes, certainly if you die on your opponent's turn, you come back, you have Living Metal essentially brings you up to 2 wins, which is not bad. It, I do believe though it does not, and I'm going to say this plenty of times, does not stop Slay the Warlord. If your, your unit is killed, then yep, they die, they get taken off, you've achieved Slay the Warlord, but they may come back at the end of the turn. I believe that happened in a, uh, a battle report that uh, Games Workshop streamed. So it's nice to have, but it's not going to stop victory points there either. But certainly having a, a character come back is always very useful. In Tropic Strike, one command point, use a stratagem in the fight phase before a Necron character from your army fights. Involve saves cannot be taken against the first close combat attack made by this character this phase. Yeah, it's okay. You can only do two damage at minus four AP. You still might miss with the attack, which is embarrassing. You still may fail to wound, and even when, uh, you know, they may even pass with a regular armor save. Minus four should mean that a two plus armor save comes to six, and they still might pass it, you know, and then they're still gonna have the rest of their involve saves. I mean, it's just unlikely with minus four, but still, armor might still happen. I can see this being better on heavier hitter forces, things that do maybe three damage, d6 damage, or higher. Two damage for a command point to ignore them is not as ideal. There may be times when you're facing a Storm Shields character and you're like, I really need to bring them down and you need to spend every command point to make it more reliable. But on two damage, I'm just not that sold. Maybe a case of against Terminators with Storm Shields as well. Yeah, you might want to spend a command point to reliably kill one. But again, you might still roll that one to hit and maybe not even win, so it's kind of a bit more difficult. I would have preferred if this was two, maybe three command points two maybe, and then involve saves just couldn't be taken. That would have been nice. Methodical Destruction, two command point. Use the stratagem after a Sutek unit from your army has attacked an enemy unit and the attack results in an enemy unit using, losing one or more wounds. Add one tip rolls for that attack made by other Sutek units from your army that target the same enemy unit. 
this space. So I didn't realise this worked in combat, uh, and for my playstyle this would be really good. Wound with Ob Oberon on a big unit that's got a load of wounds or loads of stuff on it, then have lay in with Lich Guard or Race to get the extra hit bonus. Painful. If you are playing combat like me, you're probably going to be playing Novak instead, not Sutek. But yeah, you know, in the crazy, crazy Deceiver drop, you know, you might bring in a Lich Guard unit with Oberon, and yeah, you might use a stratagem to shred to death, but I certainly believe you are going to see more advantage from this when it is used in the shooting phase rather than combat, but it is still something nice to think about. Have Oberon open up and then a big unit of Lich Guard will go in and shred them more apart. So yeah, that is my thoughts on Vargard Oberon. When it comes to him and Nemesis Zandrek, I really believe the best ability for him is team together, they work like a kind of Decent Lord, Decent Overlord combination, but the mobility changeover can be quite important if you have, uh, you know, sort of thought about it and you're going to use it to its full advantage. Yeah, it can do quite well. Use them singularly, you know, on their own, they may not be as good. Use them together opens up a plethora of sort of mobility options, which can be a lot of fun. So yeah, thanks again for watching. Please comment, share, like and subscribe. Let us know about your thoughts on Farquhar and Oberon and Emerson Sandrick. You know, using them in combination now. Do they make up for their points when they are used to do that more sort of mass movement? Or are they just a bit more expensive versions of Overlords and of uh, Lords themselves? Check us out on social media. We've got a whole bunch of products coming up. We're hoping to have quite a few of them done by the end of the month. So we've got some exciting stuff coming there. And also check us out on Patreon to help support the channel so we can bring you more content because we absolutely love doing so. So thanks again and we'll see you on another Tabletop Salt Battle Report.